diminished view of kinship is our view of power. What is it that changes the nature of something? Can you force something, a person, to change? Is that real power? But when you say that Jesus has all authority, all power, he's the king of kings, what does that really mean? When you say he's in charge, how is he in charge of your life? And what do you need to yield to him so that he might have the kind of powerful authority in your life that he desires? Not what you make up in your mind like he's made you do something, but the king of kings who allows you to respond and desires your response. And I want to ask another question in light of this, which is a sideline to a sideline. So holiness, kingship, but I also want to ask, we'll get there today, well, how does the doctrine of assurance play into all this? Assurance is a theme that I think is tied in the scripture to the kingship of God. You can know his authority, know his power, know he's won the victory for you, he's brought you out of, the, out of Egypt, he's brought you to himself, very kingly actions, but you are to know that. You are to live in the light, to be assured of, and to live in assurance of his saving grace. Now, for me, I always go back to Jesus for anything theological, but I, I had a fun time looking at all of the parables. Most of them, I should say. <laughs> I had to go and make sure that I wasn't miscounting them. But based upon how you define parable, many scholars say we have about 43. Some are not real clear. They may or not be parables, but 43 is, is a pretty good ballpark. 13 of them, so a little less than a third, have direct correspondence to the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. So a comparison and all those discussions of seeds and, and all kinds of animals and, and growing up on, on paths, all of those parables, many of them have a direct connection to kingship, the kingdom of God. In John chapter 6, you'll remember, there's the most clear contrast of the two kinds of kingship I've been talking about. The kingship of power, the kingship of a provider, that people say, well, that's my king, he provides free things I need, and the kind of king that Jesus said he was, and that is that he was going to bleed and die so graphically that you had to take his blood and imbibe that reality, his death, and eat his flesh, the bread of his life. So John 6 is a graphic picture of two views of, con of kingship, and Jesus says, you don't like my kingship. You are going to run away from me, and thousands did that day. Another thing I've seen, this is all through the scripture. My study of a couple of years in the book of Ezekiel showed that the pivot in all of Israel's history keeps coming back to a shepherd slash king. Shepherd, yes, but often the shepherd is a king, and the true king is that shepherd who knows the sheep have no shepherd, and he comes and he rules over them, but he rules in an incredibly caring way. So any leader in Israel that's worth their salt is one who treats his people, the people of God, with a shepherd-like care. Now, all of you know that Jesus was called Lord all of his life. It could be Mr. Kurios, could be Mr., but most often in context it means you are the Lord, you are the King. We must be very clear that when we say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the Anointed. You're not saying Jesus and his last name. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. It's a title of his role as king. Anointed priest, yes, but the main word there for Messiah is the one who's come as king over our lives. And that makes, of course, the importance of even the birth of Jesus and the contrast to all those kings around him. Who is this king? Where is this king? Herod is screaming, running around. You've got the weak King Herod who's killing everyone he loves versus the king who is a babe, the weakest link in the chain, if you will, just a couple of miles away in Bethlehem, the true king of kings. And at the end of Jesus' life, you've got lots of talk about kings. Herod, Pilate, Caesar, all these kings are, are flummoxed by the, the reality of Jesus. So at the beginning and end of the life of Jesus, kingship takes on this remarkable sort of bookend approach. Who is the true king? Who's the real king in the midst of all this political hubbub? Now, let me come to the prayer life of Jesus. We know that Jesus relates to his father as father and son from eternity. But when he teaches us to pray, 
I'm sure you noticed it as I was reading it. He says this, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your nature, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So you've got a kingly father. You've got the authority in the ancient Near East. A father had total authority over his family. It's called patrofamilias. The, the father could do whatever he chose with his children. It's kind of a weird thing when you and I look at it today, but that's the way it was. And the same thing applies here. Father is not some nice term like a daddy concept for Jesus. It's an, in the prayer, it is your kingdom come. And notice Jesus, who is the king, he says the kingdom's already near, come near to you. It's already come in Jesus, but he's going to work out the kingdom in the life of Jesus and in the life of those who are the followers of Jesus. His purpose is a kingly purpose. Thy will, your father-like will, your king-like will. Could I say father-king? Your father-king will is the purpose, and that purpose will be followed by your provision. That you will provide love, of course, but also daily bread, physical and spiritual bread. He'll provide for all of our lives. That's what a king was known for. We talked last week about the covenant. Part of the commitment for a king was to provide for his people. And then you have the Father's purposes, his will, his provision, daily bread, but you also have his pardon. So the king is the one who pardons them. Forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's, a, it's an authoritative, yes, it's Father. The Father is the primary sector of our concept of God. But notice the kingship of this father, his total authority, who then ends up protecting us from the evil one. So you have that conflict of kingdom again. And then we close, not every passage does, but we know this is a fundamental response to this prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Those are all kingdom themes. So we have a father, an eternal father in Jesus. But the prayer that, form, that forms our prayer life is a prayer of those who understand his absolute kingship. His kingdom has come. And when his kingdom comes, we know his purposes, his provision, his pardon, and his protection. Now, I have loved over the years diving into the prayers of the early church. And one of the prayers that's fascinating to me, and it was first alluded to me, not because I noticed it, is because someone is of the caliber of, of Tim Keller. And some, I think it was a, a, a cassette tape. <laughs> that's going to really date me. A cassette tape sermon I was listening to, I think, maybe in Israel, maybe some other foreign country. I, I forget where I was, but I'll never forget just saying, oh my word, I've missed this all of my life. The first prayer of the church Last week we talked about Acts chapter 2, but the first prayer of the church is a probably a small group. It comes after the threat and release of, of Peter and John in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. But notice the words that they choose. So the first recorded prayer we have is this, verse 24. And when they heard they'd been released, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord, that's the word I really love, one with them with Don, and said, O oh Lord, is, it is thou who didst make the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by thy Holy Spirit, through the mouth of your, our father David, thy servant, can say, why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city, there continues, that's a quote from a psalm, Verse 27, for truly it is in this city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, who thou didst anoint, there's the Messiah, Christ idea, anointing a king, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Notice all the kings and rulers involved in that frame. To do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence. So notice their boldness comes out of a, a clear conception of the sovereign kingship of God. He's the creator. He's the absolute sovereign Lord. They're, they're confident, but they're also humble in his presence. And notice the recurring concept of kings. They're confronting kings. How? Through your anointed king. Through the king of kings, Jesus 
is also your son, the Lord of Lords, and we trust in you. Their prayer life is certainly huge. How many of us know exactly what's going to happen on Palm Sunday? We're going to talk about that magnificent civilization, and it was buried under volcanic ash when Mount Vesuvius erupted so many years ago, back in the biblical times. And there in Pompeii, you can see the, the body of a man that had been encased in ashes. He's on the floor of a magnificent home. And uh, just out of his fingertips is a bag. It was a bag of gold. And he's, he's reaching for that bag. The ashes are falling all around him. And in seeking to gain that gold, he lost his life. Jesus said, what should a profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Are you saved? I want to say one more thing to you, and please listen to me. If you think... I wanted you here this morning so I could twist your arm into giving. You missed it by light years. I want you to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. And once you know him, I want you to trust him in such a way that he can open the windows of heaven on your head and bless you. Bow your heads in prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, no one stirring, no one moving, everyone praying. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to pray a prayer like this right now. Dear God, just speak to him. Dear God, I know that you love me. And I know that you want to save me. And I need to be saved. My sins deserve judgment. I need forgiveness. I need cleansing. I want a place in heaven. I want power in my life. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins on the cross. Thank you for paying my sin debt. I now trust you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, into my life now. Receive me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Just pray that. Save me, Lord Jesus. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Pray it, say it, and mean it. Save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Did you ask him? Then by faith, pray this way. Thank you for saving me. I receive it by faith, and that settles it. You're now my Lord, my Savior, my God, and my friend, and Lord Jesus, if you'll just give me the strength today, I'll make it public. I'll not be ashamed of you. You died for me. I'll confess you as my Lord and Savior. Just give me the strength, Lord Jesus, to do it. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you pray to receive Jesus just now, we would love to celebrate with you. Go to our Find God's Love page on the website, and you'll discover insights about your newfound faith. There's also the opportunity to take the next steps in your walk with God. Go to lwf.org slash radio and click the tab that says Find God's Love. Welcome to the family of God. We can't wait to hear from you today. Now, if you'd like to order a copy of today's message in its entirety, call us at 1-877-LOVE-GOD. Mention the title, Faithful in Stewardship. This message is also part of the Insightful Factors of Faithfulness series. For that complete seven-message collection, call 877-LOVE-GOD or order online at lwf.org slash radio or write us at Love Worth Finding, Box 38600, Memphis, Tennessee, 38183. Well, thank you for studying in God's Word with us. Are you in financial bondage, seeking freedom from an indebted spirit? Remain faithful in stewardship. Return to God, understanding He wants you first and foremost. Then trust God fully as you give back what He has freely given you. We hope you'll tune in next time for more from Adrian Rogers, right here on Love Worth Finding. We're so encouraged.
encouraged by a brief word of encouragement from a pastor who connected online and of his, the son of his love. So the strength of this metaphor, the king's crossword, is that he penetrates my evil. Thank you, love worth finding, for your gracious ministry. Well, if you've listened for any amount of time, you know we love to inspire and equip you with messages and resources for your daily Christian walk. And to thank you for your gift right now, we'd love to send a copy of the book, What Every Christian Ought to Know. In his refreshingly relatable style, Adrian Rogers covers essential topics such as salvation, resisting temptation, and finding God's will. Request a copy of the book, What Every Christian Ought to Know, when you call us at 1-877-LOVE-GOD, or give online at lwf.org slash radio. And thanks for your generous support of love worth finding. And be listening for Love Worth Finding with Dr. Adrian Rogers at its regular time, 11 a.m., Monday through Friday on 770 KAAM. It's time for Wonderful Words of Life with Nella Phillips. Have you seen Moments with Nella on YouTube.com? These are one-minute videos you don't want to miss. These biblically-based inspirational moments will brighten your day and bring you a chuckle or two along the way. Then be sure to click on subscribe. There's absolutely no charge to you or your pocketbook. And if you click on the bell, you'll be notified when a new video is posted. That's Moments with Nella on YouTube.com. Here's Nella. One of the stories little children learn when first attending Sunday school is of the Hebrew baby Moses in the bulrushes. How the Pharaoh's daughter discovered the infant in a basket and took him to the palace to be reared as her son. Ogaza. Ogaza. あの、車の引っ込み具合見たらわかるけど、あれすごいあの勢いであの当たらないとあれほどのあのバンバンパワーの曲がらないと思う。だからあれどっかで突っ込まれたんだと思うよ。なんか感じ的に。止めてた場所
blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol are common, but your cognitive numbers are also important, especially if you're age 65 or older. Better to act sooner rather than later if you want to maintain or enhance your brain's health. Hello, I'm Kevin, president of the Dementia Society of America, a national nonprofit organization. I'm excited to offer you a free guide filled with tips for better brain health and important facts about dementia, care planning, and much more. Go to 1-800-DEMENTIA.ORG or call 1-800-DEMENTIA. Your brain will thank you. Family Talk, the radio broadcasting division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I am that James Dobson, and I'm so pleased that you've joined us today. Welcome to Family Talk Weekend. I'm Roger Marsh, and thanks for making time during your weekend to take us along or to have us with you at home. Family Talk is listener-supported radio, and your partnership makes these programs possible. We have a great program for you today, so let's jump right in. Well, welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. You know, Jesus warned his followers that their lives would not be easy ones. Their confession and acceptance of him as Savior and Lord would lead to constant ridicule and attacks from the culture. The merciless persecution of the church has been well documented throughout the centuries, and yet Christ reminds us that our faith is grounded in the truth of Scripture. As we read these words of Jesus from John chapter 17, verse 14, I have given them your word, he prayed, and the world hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. And God is always with us in spite of this disadvantage we seemingly have. Think about this. If we don't wholeheartedly trust what the Bible tells us about us and about God, then why would we continue to believe it in the first place? I'm a fool if scripture is not true. I've built my whole life on a facade, and it makes no sense unless Christ is Christ and is God, and his words are those words that we have to live by, that I've been living a fool's dream, and I'm ashamed of it. But if they are true, then I've got to conform my life to them, or at least seek forgiveness from him for those times when I don't. Imagine what the church could accomplish in turning the culture around if it would make resolute stands at every opportunity to say, you know, I believe what I believe because it's in scripture. Scripture's true. That was today's guest, Hugh Hewitt, who is an attorney, a law professor, and a broadcast journalist. Hugh has been a professor of constitutional law at Chapman University Law School since 1995. Professor Hugh Hewitt also hosts The Hugh Hewitt Show, a popular radio program with over 2 million listeners nationwide every week. During former President Reagan's administration, Hugh Hewitt served for six years in various positions. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School and the esteemed Harvard College. Hugh Hewitt has appeared on national television news outlets and is the New York Times best-selling author. Hugh is married to his lovely wife, Betsy, and together they have three grown children and several grandchildren. Today's program was recorded several years ago, but shockingly is even more relevant today than it was back then. Our own Dr. James Dobson will now sit down with Hugh Hewitt to discuss Hugh's book entitled The Embarrassed Believer, Reviving Christian Witness in an Age of Unbelief. They will be addressing why so many Christians are either afraid or too uncomfortable to share their faith. Hugh Hewitt will also explain the decline of Christianity here in the United States. Dr. James Dobson begins today's episode by asking Professor Hugh Hewitt about the inspiration for the book. So let's join them right now, right here on Family Talk. Tell us who the embarrassed believer is. Well, the embarrassed believer was me, and I think it is a large, if not overwhelming, percentage of your listeners. The embarrassed believer is anyone who has passed by an opportunity to tell the people in their lives, in their workplaces, in their schools, in their clubs and associations, the saving news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's anyone who has hesitated for fear of finding themselves on the wrong side of the culture, embarrassed by a rebuke from someone, or in just fumbling through the basic message of the gospel. That's the embarrassed believer. If on a particular 
uh, the Sunday morning, you walked into a church that would represent the average Christian community, if there is such a thing, probably isn't. Uh, would the majority of the people there be courageous or cowardly in their approach to Christianity? It pains me to say it, I think it's cowardly. And, and here's, here's a test. I give this test when I talk to people. I know that most of your listeners believe that Jesus Christ was real, that he was incarnate God, that he was crucified for our sins, atoned for our sins, and was raised from the dead and sits at the right hand of God. But now, do the people around them believe that they believe it? Or do they just simply think it's a social endeavor? And if the answer is that the folks around you have some doubt as to the depth of your commitment to that historical truth, then you're an embarrassed believer. And like me, I'm not condemning, because I am very much struggle with this all the time. The culture does not like Christians to discuss their faith or the stakes involved. Uh, I think we have to throw off that timidity if we're going to do what we're called upon to do. Why are they so timid? There are a number of different answers to that. One of the reasons I wrote the book is I thought if I could analyze and identify the reasons that we are embarrassed, we might be able to overcome them. Why are we afraid? Knowing what your fears are, you can face them. First of all, the elite media in this country has great contempt for Christianity. Uh, and almost uh, every newspaper, in almost every network, in almost every elite magazine that I have become familiar with, and I'm a journalist, so I read all of these, there is an underlying tenor of not just disrespect, but actual contempt for people who believe that Christ is God and does save from sins. And that manifests itself in numerous, numerous ways. You know, uh, Christians in some ways remind me of an army that's pinned down. Uh, there are bullets flying overhead, machine guns just four or five feet above the, uh, our heads, and people are afraid to put their heads up for fear they'll get hit, and there they're crouched close to the ground uh, so as not to be wounded. Uh, that's not the position that Christ has asked us to take. He told us to stand up uh, for the things that we believe in, in other words. I think you're absolutely right. I think American Christianity is best analogized to a very large fort very powerful fort. It's hard to get inside. The people inside the fort are in good shape. We take care of each other. We have our own publishing networks. We have our own means of communication. You're one of the generals inside the fort, and people know where to go to get their solace. But we're not sallying forth. We're not carrying the battle out. And I think what that means is not just that the culture has ended up where it is, but that we are not doing the Great Commission's work. We're not letting people know that the most important issue is the one that involves accepting Christ. Uh, Hugh, uh, coming back to what uh, we were talking about there, uh, how do you explain the hatred today uh, for those of us who take the Bible and the claims of Christ seriously? It's because the Bible makes a claim of absolute truth, not relative truth, not something that works for you if you want to accept it, but absolute truth. Moreover, it carries with it not an implicit, but an explicit warning that those who do not conform their lives to this absolute truth end up not just losing money or position or rank or stature, they end up losing eternity. I included a chapter in this book because I thought it was something that had fallen into disuse in the church called A Few Kind Words for Hell. I have to remind people, because it, even within the church it's an uncomfortable subject to talk about, that Christ was explicit in the description of hell, as has been every great theologian. That is politically incorrect even in the Christian church, isn't it? Yes, it is, and, and I can't understand how we will discount this great danger to people at the risk of hurting their feelings. Hugh, you, you have listed those words. You call them embarrassing words, starting from easy-to-say words within the Christian context all the way to hard-to-say words. It begins with spirituality. That's not very difficult to say. Belief system, religion, faith, the divine, even God. But then it's moving down the continuum. Lord, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Christ, Jesus, which you call the J word, my Savior, and hell. And there are even others that go on down from there. But we are to even express the words that Christ said uh, in the Gospels. Yes, and it's because we do not want to be thought anti-intellectual. We don't want to be thought intolerant. We don't want to be thought to be oppressing individuals. Have you been accused of being intolerant? Many, many times. I'm a Republican, a Presbyterian, a lawyer, and uh, uh, and someone has written this book, and so I'm, I'm three strikes and you're out on the intolerant switchboard. <laughs> but, the, but that doesn't make me intolerant. I'm not. 
I'm very concerned for people. Roberta Heston, this is one of my guests on the PBS show, Searching for God in America, used an analogy that's been around the church for a long time, but it was powerful. If you go to a surgeon, and the surgeon knows you're desperately ill, you don't want him to fudge on the diagnosis for fear of causing you distress. You want him to give you the hard, cold facts and then to go after the disease. I think the reason we shirk from telling people the hard, cold fact that their soul is in eternal peril is that we don't want that temporary discomfort to come back at us. It's a very unpleasant uh, exchange with an unbeliever, but it's one that has to be made. It's been around for several decades. Uh, you may remember Carl Menninger's book, Whatever Became of Sin. You heard of that? Yes, I've heard of it. I have not read it. Well, it's the same uh, concept here where uh, sin is not something churches want to deal with. Now, I'm generalizing, and I'll get a lot of mail from from pastors and churches uh, who have not made that mistake, but sin makes us uncomfortable, it makes us guilty, and it makes us uh, uh, feel the need for uh, a place to hide. That's what Adam and Eve tried to do, um, but it is central to the understanding of the gospel. If you don't understand the disease, you don't understand the cure. That's right, and we are playing with people's souls when we believe it's someone else's job to bring them not only the bad news of sin, but the good news of salvation. That's the, the message of this book is not for pastors and for people who I call professionals, whose job and ministry it is to work full time to propagate the gospel. It's for the business owner, it's for the carpool mom, it's for the waitress, it's for anyone who comes into contact with non-believers. It's our job, not just the job of the church in a capital C kind of way, but it is the job of Christians everywhere and it used to be routine that we would do this. Let me take you back uh, to the issue of the assault on Christianity within the culture. Uh, and I find that it moves along a continuum. Uh, not only with reference to this situation here in this culture today, but uh, historically where those in power have attempted to uh, really get rid of those that they didn't like or those who opposed them, including what Hitler did to the Jews, moves along a continuum. It starts with uh, humor and ridicule. It moves from there to vilification and uh, to demonization. You know, these are wicked people. These are really evil, wicked people that are trying to hurt other folks. And so it moves from one to the other. And then we move to the third, which is censorship. They have no right to talk because they are wicked. And it goes from there on to the final step, which is persecution. I believe we are moving from demonization to censorship on our way to persecution. Now, if we are embarrassed and, and intimidated now, before we run the gamut of this thing all the way to persecution, what are we going to do in that environment where our lives might be in danger? Uh, the collapse of the fort would occur. You see, the culture will allow you to live in, on islands of Christian belief. The archipelago can be, in fact, very large, and the culture will not challenge it. To move out and attempt to evangelize is going to invite the very kind of reaction that you've talked about. Historically, that is the case. But we don't have a choice. I don't think it's really an option for a Christian to choose the comfort of the congregation which knows and supports each other's beliefs over the effort to change people's lives and bring them the good news. We especially have to go after, as Christ did, the one sheep who is the most distressed sheep. I've heard the most powerful sermons are about how God's heart breaks for people who are not in communion for him. And that that passion is what drives his commission to the church, is to go after the very people that we're trying to bring the good news to. But the persecution is going to be real. We need the courage of the Chinese house church. We need the dedication of the Sudanese in the southern part of that country. We need the willingness of the uh, Egyptian Christians that I discuss in my book who have been murdered for their faith. That spirit was once American in its and we we're afraid to share it in the workplace. Absolutely. Or with our next Bible. door neighbor, or even to live it in front of people. We keep it a secret. We are the embarrassed believer. You know, uh, we were... Uh